and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us straight from Silver Lantern Games, and, cre and creator of the upcoming fa um, fate-based fate R fate RPG and campaign setting, Cloud Runner, Fate of the Skies. How many times am I going to say fate in this interview? The, <laughs> one and o the one and only, don't call him Dennis, Dylan Green. How you doing tonight, man? Hi, I'm doing well. Glad to be here. Um, I'll also point out, Dennis is a new one. I've been called Dustin, and let's see here. I, I've been called Dustin, and I've also been called Daniel, so... <laughs> well, I, um... I'm from I'm from Minis I'm from Minnesota and when when and one of and one of the one of the coaches of the Vikings when that that I had to put up with growing up was Dennis Green so I had to make the <laughs> I had to make at least I got to get at least one bad joke out of my system it's part of my contract I'm going to I'm going to ask my aunt and uncle about that because they live in Minnesota so yeah oh <laughs> well if well if you do that ask make sure to ask them if they. Make uh, make sure to ask them if they if they if that time in Minnesota was at the city's Del Derange or Duluth. Ah, I got you. <laughs> All right. But so any anyhow. <laughs> yeah. So I like to start with the humble beginnings, in a sense. With that in mind, I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what was it that made it stick. So. I started playing in college and I kind of went with, I started with 3.5 um, and I was playing that for a while. I decided I, you know, I'm a creative person. I would really love the DM. My first DMing experience goes awful in every conceivable way. Like um, lots of upset players. I, walked out of every um every session like feeling completely drained and i felt awful um and in retrospect i realized that it was kind of because i was just kind of thro uh, thrown in without much support or guidance from anyone else before me um and i i think you know it was also because even though i would follow the rules what often would happen is is that some players were like well this doesn't feel right. Like, and that I, I'm thinking in particular, someone got upset because, um, I didn't let a nat 20 go over a skill check. Um, so for a skill check because it was just so ridiculously high, but turns out that the rules were with me, but still that kind of stung because the player just left and we didn't really have any communication. So I, I just kind of dipped entirely from that. And I was like, I'll never touch RPGs again just because of how, how nightmarish it was. And, you know, I get a different friend group, and they say, hey, why don't you try this again? And it took a lot of coaxing, because I was like, what if, what if things go south like they did before? And they didn't. Not this time around. In fact, it did pretty well. I started with 3.5. Then I went to 5th edition. Um, over time... You know, I began kind of designing my own fantasy world, and this was this was the fantasy world of Ragnar, not not Escatus, which is in Cloud Runner. But eventually, I kind of was like, "Well, what if I want to explore other genres?" And so I started looking around, mm -hmm. and my local game store. You know, I I was talking to them about kind of the style of games that I run, and they recommended Fakor, and that was one of the best decisions that. I ever made, or at least, you know, in terms of getting that recommendation, I would go out, you know, and fake core, and I got to the party late on it, but it really changed how I viewed RPGs, and I started with a couple of, um, you know, sort of IP campaigns, um, I actually probably picked what what is hard mode for this, which is Silent Hill, and it ended up kind of not working the first time, working the second time. 
Um, and, you know, eventually, though, I was like, I've got this system that I know what to do with, and it's kind of a system that's built with my exact kind of um, sensibilities in mind. So I'm going to do something with it. And during that time, I was working on writing a book, um, and this was back when Cloud Runner was more along the lines of a novel. And I said, I'm just going to use this to world build. I'm just going to do one campaign, and, um, you know, it'll be one and done, and that'll be that. So that doesn't happen. What happens instead is that Cloud Runner becomes my most popular setting. <laughs> um, it becomes overbooked. You know, I have like eight people showing up for a game. They love it. They love um, the steampunk fantasy world. They love how it's, you know, this world in the sky, the airship combat, you know, all of it just goes over really well. So then I say, okay, well, I guess it's an RPG now. And it, yeah, the, the game overtakes the novel. I am, you know, working on it on and off for the next three years. And here it is now on Kickstarter. So that's where I am. Mm -hmm. Now, with with that kind of thing in with that kind of thing in mind, um, obviously jumping from jumping from D, jumping from the D twenty system to the to the fudge dice based um, Fate Core is quite a leap. To say the to say the absolute leap. To say the absolute least, it's it's like having a it's like having a diet of McDonald's and then go, and then go and and then go into a gourmet burger place. Um, <laughs> not to not to dis, not to disparage D and D like that like and compare it to McDonald's, but I think you, I think you get where I'm going. Um, but what I, what I'm curious what I'm curious about is um. Walk is I'd like you to walk me through some of the things that you realized that you had to unlearn when you when you um when you jumped when you jumped onto fate. So you are absolutely correct in that like it is a very serious paradigm shift. I had to kind of throw out like a lot of knowledge that I had. It's like, you know, I have an idea of like this is how things are supposed to be structured and blah blah blah. But um I, you know, over time I realized, okay, well, I'm working within a different system with a different paradigm. And the, the thing is, is that it wasn't really something I was conscious of because um, it was more like, I'm just going to start working within the system. Um, and there are a lot of things that draw me into fate as, as a system, like the bronze rule, for example, where you can just make anything a character. I mean, there is a reason that clock is going to be in fate it's because of that that flexibility of the bronze rule and you know getting a feel for how the system works again it wasn't like i had any specific thoughts on how to do it it was more like the generalized i can't handle things the same way like i would in D. &D. Mm -hmm. i would have to approach it differently it's an approach that i'm used to because i'm an english major with a background in kind of narrative so what I, I was able to get it relatively quickly. Um, and I do notice that it tends to be a, a thing where people who are coming to fate from D&D, &D, they have to do that unlearning process. And I think mm -hmm. it was easier for me because I already, even my D&D &D campaigns were very like, I'm just going to do, you know, a more narrative centric approach. And, you know, that was the case for when I was running Rognim, you know, for the past couple of years by that point. Um, and it worked. So, you know, what happened was it just, it was kind of, again, it was a system that even though it did take some unlearning, there was also a lot of curiosity of like, oh, I can mess with this, and it'll do this. Like, the thing I really like about Fate is that it shows you its dials, and it tells you, like, okay, well, if you mess with this, that will, you know, that will give you something. Mm -hmm. And that will change the game in this way. Um, I started kind of doing smaller settings beforehand, like Shadow over Enolek, which was kind of my gothic horror take. Um... 
you know, I used mechanical stuff like um, blood magic and kind of messing with the way that stress worked because I wanted to create a specific feel and, you know, evoke genre tropes. Um, and then over time, as I kind of got used to these smaller projects, um, I started moving into Cloud Runner and, you know, getting that together. Yeah. Now, as I know, Cloud Runner, as I understand it, is steampunk fantasy with a with a large with a with a I won't say large but a significant emphasis on on airships and the kind of steam tech that's often seen in this genre. For you, what's the appeal of that particular genre? What was it that drew you t you to it to want to um, write the, write the story in that kind of um, backdrop? So. Cloud Runner originally started as a space opera, and and uh, I call it in retrospect Star Runner, even though it was called Cloud Runner, w which I find hilarious because it's like it's it's a name that's so tailor made for steampunk, and I didn't see it at the time. But basically, as I was writing the original draft of Star Runner, I said this is a cold, you know, distant sort of like feel like it didn't feel you know fun to read it didn't feel fun to write it was very sort of like space especially is such a lonely and isolating place and that can work in its benefit but it wasn't the the wasn't what i was trying to go for i wanted something that was a little bit more you know um i guess it would be like comprehensible scale mm -hmm. and I was thinking about pieces of media that I had, you know, I had watched recently. And I will point out that the big thing that influenced Cloud Runner is, of course, Skies of Arcadia, um, which is this beloved piece of my childhood that I just, it was this wonderful adventure that I felt genuinely good about in terms of, like, playing through. It was this really... It, it was one of the more, like, unique experiences that I haven't been able to really get a replication for, you know, ever since. Mm -hmm. And so I said, okay, well, let's make it, you know, like Skies of Arcadia. Uh, you know, everyone's living in the sky. You know, there are these islands floating around and airships are everywhere. It's so central to the game. And, um, you know, having an airship and flying around is such an appealing thing um there's also kind of a more meta reason to it which is like at the time i was going through college and i'm going to point out that as someone who is neurodivergent i was dealing with a system a school system that was hostile to me it was dealing with this cold and unfeeling system that was you know like well, I, I guess if you can work through the bureaucracy, we'll throw you a bone every once in a while, but we're actually not going to do it. Or if I would, you know, tell my, my professors that, like, hey, my home situation is really bad right now, and I need to, and I, and I might need some accommodations. I don't even know if I'm going to have a place to live in the next few months. Um, and I got nothing. And so the idea of, like, flying through the skies in an airship just sounded so appealing of, like, having that level of freedom in this environment that was so strictly controlling, that was so, um, you know, just uncaring, unfeeling, and completely, you know, apathetic to the needs and wants of the student body, which, mm -hmm. you know... It it felt just genuinely good, and it was clearly something that I wasn't alone in because the the sheer concept, uh, the core concept of Cloud Runner, has been enough to make people go, "Yeah, let's play it." It's and it's the same kind of concept that I think Skies of Arcadia tapped into, which was you know the idea that just flying around in the skies on an airship, going wherever you want, that sounds fun. Mm -hmm. Now, with that with that in with that in mind, um, I would I would 
Uh, first off, I will give you your props for um, for bringing up Skies of Arcadia. Good choices. Good choice there. Um, se second second off, um, I'd like to go, I'd like to go into a bit of the a bit of Ascatus and the and, and the Endless Blue, um, just for, just from a lore perspective. Now. Are we deal are we dealing with a are we dealing with a world where most where most people have not seen what would be considered the surface? Everybody's just seen the sky, the sky and the floating islands for most of their life. So the way that I've written it is that basically it used to be because the idea another kind of idea that I get to explore with Cloud Runner is what happens when a fantasy world moves into steam tech um some properties just kind of put steam tech in and it's just there but i wanted to ask the question of like you're introducing this potentially disruptive technology into a world mm -hmm. what is that gonna do so it used to be that you know escatus was a world of sword and sorcery um and the surface was where basically everything happened um what ends up happening is is that as tech advances um you know steam becomes more ubiquitous firearms become more ubiquitous um there's a lot of conflict that emerges from that mm -hmm. and eventually you know because the magic users of the time the the storm callers a group of particularly powerful ones um known as the sumerki cabal realized if steam tech takes off our way of life is over so they start a war and while eventually steam tech wins out the the cabal manages to tear apart the fabric of the ether on the surface which renders it uninhabitable so people end up you know heading to the skies above and shortly after that there is this storm that kind of blankets the surface and splits the sky, known as the Great Tempest. And nobody has been to the surface with the exception of the Rayburn family ever since. Uh, <clears throat> which that brings that brings me to that brings me to something else. Now you've met you there's a, given the fact given the fact that you mentioned sword and sorcery as 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 a past incarnation of this world um how pre how present is the use of magic since if you look at a lot if you look at a lot of um fantasy settings some um tolkien in particular had th had this as a sub as a subtext there was this idea of the magical world starting to f starting to phase out um and in some and in some cases, you have the magical and the technological in direct conflict with each other. Where do you fall into that paradigm? So the way that I designed it is that you know, it used to be that kind of magic is this. Um, in the case of storm calling, it was something that you would do kind of as a utility thing, where like if you have a flame caller, you would you know you would ha have like kind of like a flame caller could light the way, or they could set something on fire. You know, a thunder caller could, you know, like, could just zap a tree and knock it down. Um, you know, stuff like that. It was very utilitarian. But it was a very laborious process. Very, you know, time intensive in terms of, like, you'd have to spend, you know, a good chunk of your life learning how to do it. And if you screwed up a calling, you could end up, like, with, you know, with some sort of injury um, including fatal ones. So it was considered like a necessary form of labor, but it was very dangerous and it was very time consuming. And as Steam Tech kind of came on, it became clear that this was the way that things were going to go. And at the time, nobody kind of had any recollection on how to harness the ether in a different way. There's only one civilization that has managed to do that, and that's Dead Heaven. And so what ends up happening is, is after the war ends, though, there's kind of this stigma. There are still some storm callers around, and in fact, you can make take the storm calling option um, 
as a stunt in in Cloud Runner, mm-hmm. but nothing like before. And it's very clear that you know it's not very in that universe. It's not very highly looked upon, you know, because very few people are around to practice it, and there's you know fewer are you know passing it on to people. Um, you know, very few people are passing it on to, you know, future practitioners. Um, and it's generally considered a lost art. And even, even though it is, it's also kind of, it's a question of like, well, do we really want to go back to that? And there is talk of like, is there a way we can harness the ether in a way that is, you know, better, but it is considered like this, like this form of, of labor that, you know, people are asking the question of like, well, maybe, maybe we just won't be able to, and I don't know what the consequences of that will be. They they don't know what the consequences of that will be, but it's generally considered that, you know, the world has changed for better or for worse and the age of of storm calling is likely over. Mm-hmm. Now, one of the things that I one of the things I could I couldn't help but notice when I looked at the um, when I looked at the primer for for lack of a better term the um, explorer's guide. Um, yes. Now in in that I'm not gonna I'm now I'm not gonna go too much too much into it, but in that you do have some allusions to. Um, robots are ro- is robotics or e- is robotics a co- a common thing or is that very very is that on the fringe end of things? Oh, it's super common. You you will find uh, automatons everywhere. Like um, so there are several different factions that do stuff with robotics. Basically, mm-hmm. like so there is an enemy called a kettlebot, and it's basically you know someone took a, a tea kettle and just put some, you know, automaton components in, you know, it has like an analytical core so it can do stuff and it's their pet project. And they just, and, and, it, and they just do it for fun and they just leave them everywhere. And you've also got places like the rotten Gulf, which is full of, you know, old, you know, scrapped robotics or uh, automatons and, You've got the rust assembly, which, you know, goes in, scavenges them, you know, tries to assemble them into kind of soldiers. Mm-hmm. There is, in fact, in, uh, a kind of a city that's built solely for automatons in in the north uh, called Steel Point. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they actually will bring ships down to Rotten Gulf to kind of pull you know, from, um, they will rescue scrapped or decommissioned automatons, you know, from being incinerated or from being repurposed by rust assembly. In fact, the, the, the rotten Gulf is a huge source of conflict because of that, because the, um, the, the rust assembly will come in with magnet ships and they'll just suck up whatever they can. So the goal is to get as many of those automatons out to safety uh, and to steel point as quickly as possible. Mm-hmm. Now, when it comes to when it comes to the le- when it comes to the level of um, of, ste- of steam tech, um, how far how far how far d- how far does it go? Like uh, like is the is the possibility of somebody having um, steam tech bionics a thing? Yes. So. There's one character um, in in the core rules where um, Augustus Rowley, mm-hmm. um, he he basically in kind kind of he as a character I I'm also kind of planning because the 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 sort of the playable character or the um, playable species sort of profiles that I've come up with I've kind of based them off of you know a set of characters that I want to use in another piece of media called Flight of the Sunbird, which is going to be a graphic novel. Mm-hmm. But yeah, at the at the beginning of his character arc, he basically gets his hand ampute- uh, his arm amputated, and it's just and it's replaced with a clockwork limb. So 
Um, you can get bionics. I've had people, you know, go in with bionic eyes, you know, part, you know, other legs, stuff like that. You know, it is, it is very commonplace. All right. Now, with that, with that in mind, your use now, we've are, we've gone over, we've gone over what took, what drew you in when it came to the, when it came to the fate system, but a lot of campaign settings that utilize fate, um, more often than not, won't utilize all of the vanilla rules. They will, they will, tw they will tweak and tw and twist things to the to their particular liking. With that, with that in mind, what what would be some what would be some of the major cha what would be some of the major or minor changes from the from the way Fate works in Cloud Runner to um, to Fate Core or Fate Condensed? Yeah, so um, I definitely made changes. There's no way that like I was going to run it vanilla, and I and I quickly came up with again the bronze rule is just excellent for this. So at the start, you buy an airship. Um, there, there are several that you can buy from, um, in fact, it's, it's in the rules. You can technically, you know, buy more than one, obviously they're, you know, it's expensive and you have to store them in hangars and stuff like that. But, um, airships kind of managing your ship, um, is a big part of it. Like you have to, as you're flying about, you have to make sure you're refueling. You have to make sure that like, um, you're working, you know, in repairs and stuff like that, mm -hmm. there is a level of it's it's not as um, intensive as something like you know D and D where you're kind of managing things like rations and other stuff. Um, but there is a level of of caring for your ship, of managing your ship, of you know, um, the ship being a shared resource. If you want to know kind of my biggest design lesson that I picked up from Cloud Runner that I carry into all of my other games. It's the idea of a shared resource helps players work together as a group. It has to be kind of a shared resource that they're all invested in and they're all like positively invested in. And it mm -hmm. doesn't feel like a burden or an obligation. But if they want to do stuff and yeah, like everyone's like, oh, we can pick up an airship. And that, that seems to work really well in building that shared investment. And um over time, also, I added on other things. Like, you have personal gadgets. There's no way that you're, you're going to work without personal gadgets. So, you know, everyone gets to kind of design their own, like, theme punk, you know, gadget. So it would be, like, a grappling hook or, you know, a, a, a really tweaked out firearm, you know. So those were the things that I, I made the changes I've also made a couple of smaller ones that are less noticeable. Um, there's a mechanic called Last Shot where um, basically you can declare that this is your last shot and you're going to have to reload afterwards. But if you do, you'll get a bonus to your shot. Mm -hmm. And that, bring, that brings... Uh, speaking of shots, that brings um, something else up. And this is, some, this is something that I've, that, I've ta that I've discussed with other people. Whenever you're dealing with a more a more a more advanced setup, because with those with those technological advancements, you see the advent of um, firearms, and the and the inter and the conflict that happens with with the rise of firearms versus the ch versus how melee weapons have to change and adapt. Um, but at the at the same time, a lot of people still want to have their more swashbuckly kind kind of kind of feel. So, how do you how do you make how do you make sure that especially with that last shot mechanic, that firearms don't um don't end up don't end up being the being the primary star of the show, so that if somebody wants to utilize melee weapons, they could. So the mechanical advantage because the way that the way that fate deals with it you have your fight skill and your shoot skill mm -hmm. now the one advantage obviously to a shoot skill is you can you can fire from a something that's you know more than one zone away um or at least like so if you, you don't have to be in the same zone for combat um the advantage to fight though is that you can defend with it so you know you can have a character with high fight and they can parry blows and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of the main way of dealing with it. 
I've run before, you know, a whole bunch of different um, campaigns, and yeah, people will still pick, you know, melee-based characters like Pugilists. I've had a couple of prize fighters. I've had a couple of pirates. Um, you know, it it definitely can still work, and it works just fine. So, um, it was something that I was thinking about, but you know, it seems like just every every time I play that it, it was an issue that I was concerned about, but it really didn't warrant any concern. So, yeah, it's you you can still play a melee fighter and have and have a perfectly viable character. Yeah, because like I. I grew up with I grew up with Zoro, so if I'm run, so if I'm pl if I'm playing in something like Cloud Runner, that's cer that's certainly going to be an influence. <laughs> um, I should I should say I, spe I specifically grew up with the um, Zoro cartoon in the '90s. I'm not I'm not yeah. that old where I grew up with a black and white thing. I, uh, I um, but with that with that kind with that kind of thing in with that kind of thing in mind um obviously one obviously because of the fact that we're dealing with a steampunk heavy setting and a whole lot of clockwork inevitably this is going to this is going to mean um airships which you are which you already hinted at since one of the big things early on is going to be getting your own airship so the question that i have is twofold one um do you would would a airship be treated as an asset or would it be treated as its own as its own um, shared character sheet? And two, how do you handle ship to ship conflict? So it is its own separate character. It is um, it is in fact you know you will print out a, an airship sheet. Mm -hmm. at the beginning of your campaign and you will make decisions about like it has some similar things like it here's it has a couple of stats it has um you know some aspects to it stuff like um a resource track so that you can keep you know you can manage things like it, how much coal it's got or how much spare parts you know um so it is considered its own character mm -hmm. um as for as for the other aspects of, of it, like you're talking about ship to ship conflict, and it is a big thing. Um, in fact, like I've made absolutely sure that's like, yeah, like when I was designing Pillar of Solitude, um, we there is the possibility of getting into a ship combat. Um, it it isn't that different from regular conflict. It's a bit more focused on kind of one-on-one -on -one combat, I I think that tends to be easier to manage. It can certainly go up higher, but it's a little bit more... Um, the way that it's structured is that, you know, the characters kind of can all do things related to it. Like, you get these kind of four basic actions that you can do. Like, you can communicate with the ship, you can do repairs, you can maneuver, or you can fire. Mm -hmm. And... All of those things can happen simultaneously. It uses a modified version of um, Sails Full of Stars ship combat rules. Um, I made some modifications to it because um, I think that like there were certain things that were designed to kind of work in tandem with its crew system, so I had to kind of remove that. But um, that's kind of what I was working with, and um, it works out very well. And one of the things that's really actually nice about it is that it can go from ship scale to player scale really easily in a way that um, this was, for example, one of the reasons why I picked Fate over a lot of other systems because um, being able to kind of toggle between those two scales seamlessly was kind of a big deal for me. And a lot of systems that I was trying to kind of port it to either... I would have to abstract the ship combat to such a degree that it might as well not be there. Um, or it took a lot of setup. And, you know, I was able to run over a, a period of time in Fate this kind of real, really seamless one where, you know, you'd have characters who were making decisions on the player scale and, were a and we were able to kind of showcase, switch back to the 
um, ship scale without really losing anything. So that was important. All right, that that brings now given that given that since you mentioned a airship having its having its own sheet, are there did you did you end up writing a short list of airship skills or is it using the same skill list as regular characters would? Just with a bit, just with a bit of a blurb as to how you'd use this for airship scale. So there are a few, you know, airship skills. It's really more like I would describe it as because I wanted to encourage the players to be proactive and not like sit back and let the ship do everything. Mm -hmm. So they're more like bonuses. So for example, you have gunnery is one where. Um, you can have the NPC crew take over and do it, but um, what you're probably going to end up doing is having a, a character say, okay, well, I'm going to use my shoot skill. And then the gunnery bonus gets added to that. So that was kind of my approach. I wanted to just make sure that the players were still kind of at the center of that, as opposed to, you know, the ship doing most of the legwork. Um so there are three skills that you basically get with, with the ship, and it's you have gunnery, maneuverability, and integrity. Then you've got the stunts, which are like ship upgrades and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. things like, you know, you have a mine launcher or a smoke screen or, you know, some sort of particle cannon, you know. Um, it's those are things that you would get in that sort of in that sort of arrangement in terms of, you know, you would eventually you start adding more stunts to your ship, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it is, yeah, it still functions mostly as its own sheet just because you're managing stuff with it. Um, but it is still, I would argue of secondary importance to the players. The, the ship is not, I would argue more, important than the players uh, all right I can I can get I can get that and um, give given what given what you meant given what you mentioned um, would it be fair of me to say that there's that there's gonna be a list of stunts in the full book that are um, play that are player facing and a list of stunts that are um, air that are airship facing Yes, there will be, you know, several different stunts that are like, yeah, this is for your airship, and this mm -hmm. is how you can handle it. Um, there are also kind of stunts that can interface with um, the ship itself, like the player can get one that's like, here's, you can get a bonus to your pilot role if you're in this area of the sky, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so, those are kind of kind of very important for what what I'm planning with Cloud Runner in terms of like making sure that you know you're you're interfacing with the sky as well. Like the there's you're because kind of the idea is is like you're going through the sky. There's going to be people there. There's going to be stuff happening there. Um, and you know you're going out. It's not just you and the and the sky. You know you'll run into other airships. You'll run into creatures. You'll run into you know, conflicts that are unfolding in front of you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was, I wanted to make sure that there was that, there was that notion of like, you are, you are entering into a world that is bigger than you. Mm -hmm. And there are certain ways of accomplishing that, including like, you know, there's a table that you can use to just generate random stuff in the sky. Like here's a refueling station or here's a ship that's in distress or here's like, you know, there's a small island that another ship has crashed into. Maybe you can take their cargo because loss is salvage, but you know stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the one of the thing that I saw that I saw when it came to character creation within the within the primer is the concept of a personal gadget, which is definitely something that is outside the outside the norm when it comes to Fate Core. Um, what gave you the idea to have to have that as a, as a thing that you that everybody is going to get from the get go? I really just think that like when I was when I was thinking about how you can express yourself through your character, um, and I wanted to kind of 
say, like, in this steampunk world, you know, you're going to have something that's, that's an expression of your character. And I, and, and I wanted to kind of branch out at least a little bit from the idea of a signature weapon, because um, you're not just fighting stuff. What about things like, you know, scanner glasses? That, that was a fun one. Or, um, you know, your, your typical kind of grappling hook. That's kind of the, the, the example one. Um, you know, those kinds of gadgets, I think, are, are really, really easy ways of kind of, like, showing the players. It's like, here's the kind of stuff you can do. Mm-hmm. Um, and I definitely think it's one of the core appeals are people coming up with, like, oh, well, maybe I have this kind of steampunk Wikipedia built into this sort of wrist-bound device, which which that, that was a fun one. Like, you have basically a database strapped on your, uh, on your arm in a very, almost like a Pip-Boy in Fallout. Um, I was going to go with either that or a Shadowrun on the Cyberdeck. Yeah, it's, it's very close to those, those concepts, um, definitely. Now, and with with the with the particular with the particular set particular setup of it, I'd no, I'd noticed that you ha- you added that e- that each of them had it's going to have a function and a flaw a- aspect. Um, but when it ca- but when it comes to when it comes to those, um, do you plan in the full book? Do you plan on putting a few? Exa- example pr- example ideas of what a personal gadget would would count would count as so th- so that there's a baseline yes like i i have a couple of them like i still want to kind of encourage players to kind of really imagine like i it was a tricky thing because i was debating like maybe i should just give them a huge list of gadgets but the problem is is that I think for for certain systems that would work really well for Fate. I do think that part of the reason that people play Fate is because of that more freeform approach. And I think that I said, okay, I'll give them kind of a few examples just so that they can kind of get a baseline for what they can do. But the rest is kind of more personal, mm-hmm. and that's the approach that I went with. You'll have like a grappling hook and. There are a few pregens that I will create that have their example gadgets, like a chain sword and the scanner glasses. Um, of course, there's going to be a chain sword, mm-hmm. you know. <laughs> um, and that was kind of the way that I, I went with that. Oh, all right. I can go. I can go with that. Now. I'd li- I would like to go into the different um, types of species now. Some, um, when it comes first, o- now first off, um, are there are there going to be examples of what of what aspects you could draw upon from a given choice of species? So I I was that was one question that I was wrestling with for a very very long time was what does the species mean um and this this will no doubt be a a decision that may resonate with people it may not and the ultimate decision i went with was um this is cosmetic um there isn't it's not like there aren't any mechanical differences um you will repair like in making recovery rolls with mechanics is going to be what you're going to do to help recover uh, from an automaton character. But for the most part, I kind of made the executive decision early on of saying like, because making, making the, that decision to kind of have that, you know, I was looking at games like Bulldogs and I noticed that they did kind of make a lot of decisions about like, you know, what does this, how does this change your character? And I ultimately decided against it because, um, by, by kind of making them more like skins, I was able to kind of let people experiment with sort of species and, you know, archetype combinations. There is no class system, but, um, that probably wouldn't have crossed their mind if I had kind of made that, 
decision earlier. Um, and I very much encourage this. Like, there's the reason that the, the orc example is kind of a scholar character. Mm-hmm. Um, I wanted to kind of encourage people to um, focus less on picking that optimized build and more about, like, okay, well, if we can, in this world, you will see someone in academia who is an orc. You know, this is kind of the, the possibility space that you're entering. Mm. Um, and that was my general approach when it comes to handling this. And I recognize, again, that there's going to be some people who are like, wait, what? And um, it also just kind of occurred to me that over time, you know, a lot of, a lot of things make more sense to kind of handle on an even playing field, especially when you enter into the world of firearms. Um, you know, there's less of a, there's less of a difference because, um, you know, handling things like, um, you know, traditional fantasy things like melee weapons and stuff like that, it's going to feel a little different than, you know, once you start adding firearms to the mix, you know, that's going to be less pronounced. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, that was my decision. Um, I still wanted to kind of have a variety of options. There was, you know, early on I made the decision that, like, you are still going to get these species. It's not going to be just humans only. Um, and additionally, kind of, there were, the way that I structured it is you had kind of some species that were there kind of from the beginning, like the humans, dwarves, the gnomes, the elith, and the halflings. Mm-hmm. Um, they were the orcs too. They were there from the beginning, but the beast folk and automatons are new. Uh, children of the Steam Age, and I kind of wanted to deal with that as well in the war of like, you know, that the the beast folk are a product of science, and um, the you know the automatons obviously come kind of affect that because of you know advances in tech. Mm-hmm. Now, with that with that kind of with that kind of thing in mind, um, when it comes to when it comes to when it comes to the folk species, whether it be cat folk, rat, rat folk, or the like, um, are are do you have a specific short list, or is it or is it or is it a catch all for any um, any any animal any humanoid um, animal hybrid? So I picked three. I picked cat folk, rat folk, and bird folk. Mm -hmm. There will be more in supplements, but I basically just went with those three just because I was like, I don't want to just fill it up with beast folk. Um, And, you know, the kind of... There's going to be some interesting stuff about it in, you know, supplementary stuff about, like, the, the procedures for how they were created and, you know... Um, in, in other forms of cloud runner media, there's going to be things like, you know, what does that mean when, you know, you're dealing with, you know, uh, a group of, 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 um, you know, a species that ha- doesn't have kind of the same sense of heritage or culture because, you know, literally they were the product of, you know, scientific experimentation, you know, what does that do to them? And, that's an interesting question that I hope to field in upcoming media. Mm-hmm. Now, with the, with that kind of thing in mind, um, what are you shooting for as far as the total page count? Currently, the, the page count stands at about 200. Um, I'm hoping to stay within the 200 and 250 range. Um, I the, the game is almost entirely done. And when I say almost entirely, I mean... It needs some editing, and I need to do art commissions. Um, I will also have another guest writer come in and write a fifth scenario. Um, currently, it, it the book has four, mm-hmm. um, but um, hoping that it will that it will end with five, and that's that's my ideal page count. All right, and I just I just realized there was one th- there was one thing lore wise that I that I completely. Skip, skipped over discussing that I think I think is going to be a big deal, and that is the Rayburn family. Oh, oh, oh! They're so much fun. Um, 
I'll I'll start well, with I'll start with one I'll start with one question that I have. Um, I know there's a few a few mo a few modules that you're, that are going to be in the book. What I'm curious about is how is without spoiling too much, how much of a factor does the Rayburn family play into those modules? So you will see them in Pillar of Solitude and the follow-up Watchful Eye. You're going to see them there. You are going to be um, you're going to be interacting with old Seth at the end of um, Pillar of Solitude. You will run into Lottie and a couple of members of the garden, um, her her children, in Watchful Eye. Um, Toymaker. I wanted to focus on characters um, outside of the Rayburns. Um, hmm. I. I want to point out that there, there's also the, the, the ever, the ever increasing, you know, scope of the world, and I have had, had to like hold off because it's like I love the Rayburns, but it's like no, you can't put them in everything. You've got to let the other people have a time to shine. But I, I love them. They are so much fun to write, um, especially Lottie's kids, the garden. They're they are an absolute joy. Um, old Seth will be showing up and you can, um, in, uh, classified cargo. Um, I do kind of want to have maybe the cousins. I will also point out in a future supplement, mm -hmm. uh, the player can create a member of the Rayburn family that they can, they can play as a Rayburn. So that's a, that's a fun one. Um, you'll get to see the family dynamics from the inside, kind of the, how it, how it functions, how, um, it's quirks. The dysfunctionality of it, um, the kind of kind of the way that I characterize it is very much like the the sort of inherent contradiction of Victorian ideals, where like it's all about appearances and kind of you know putting on a good impression. Like in the Cloud Runner novel, like there's a point where before capturing the main character, Lottie basically says, okay, let's have dinner first. Like it, it very concerned about appearances, very concerned about hospitality, you know, and then, you know, at, at the end of it, one of the kids just knocks one of them out uh, in the back of the head, you know, and that's, so it's that kind of juxtaposition of, you know, looking good, appearing good and you know just on the other hand just being kind of brutal yeah now with that with that in mind the, the big reason why why I asked how um, about the about their presence in the modules is I is I could see I could see them being very tempting to to fall into the um to fall into the Moriarty trap um you know where where every st every story in every story in Sherlock Holmes somehow tied back to Moriarty in some way. Yes, and I have been very careful to kind of make sure that they do not fall into that. Like, um, they are present in Watchful Eye. They are not the main villain. Um, and they often show up to interfere, and as, as more of an obstacle, but um. They are they are handy to kind of pull out and say like okay well they're inter they're they're causing interference. I also kind of want to have some modules where the players work with the Rayburns. You know they form an alliance. You know tenuous as it is, um, but I also want to because I completely understand your concern and it was one that I had when I was putting it together. It's like the Rayburns are great. I love them, but there does need to be you know, a world beyond them. Um, you know, other characters, other factions, I made absolutely sure that, like, you're going to be running into people like, um, you know, Rufus Buckle, or, um, you know, who, who runs Rust Assembly. Um, you know, you're going to be running into other characters, too, like the Vor um, not the Vortex Rogues. The Vortex Rogues are on the player's side, but you'll run into the Corsairs, the Mantija, you know, making sure that there is a world that's so much bigger that is, you know, 
something that you can pull out because the Rayburns are not going to fit everywhere. Mm -hmm. But they are fun. They're so much fun. Uh, <clears throat> and with, with that, now with that kind of thing in mind, what would you be shooting for as far as a release window for the project? Not a release date well, I, per se, but a but a general window. So I put, and, and this was something that, admittedly, I did, you know, and I feel like I did because this is just a project of the same scope. I put, um, twenty twenty three. It's going to be done well before then. Um, I'm trying to get it done between six months to a year from now. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think that I have. The kind of the thing that I'm really, really, that's the biggest question mark right now is, like, how long is it going to take to get all those art commissions done? And um, I have several artists working on it, and I'm just going to be, as soon as the, the Kickstarter is wrapped, I'm going to be meeting up with all of them and making sure that, like, okay, well, let's form a timeline um, and get whatever I can done. Um, I will point out again, the the book is playable. Like, you can run it right now. Um, and the only things that's missing gameplay-wise are a few stat blocks, which are written up. I just have to include them. Mm -hmm. um, and that fifth adventure. All right. I, and I, I will be... I'll certainly be looking forward to, to seeing how that plays... how that plays out. Um, and as I, as I'm aware, one of the reward tiers you had is for <coughs> sorry is for a, is for a soundtrack. How did that come about? I have a friend who's a composer, and I, I was telling him about Cloud Runner, and he just loved the concept. So I I asked him, it's like, can you can you run up, write up a few tracks? And he did, and they they sound incredible. Um, he knows how to capture the spirit of Skies of Arcadia. Like, you could you could listen to it, and it's like, it's almost like you could pick it up the cutting room floor uh, of Skies of Arcadia. Um, he really captures the feel. Um, in fact, the, the Kickstarter video features his music. Um, and as such, he's like, yeah, sign me up. Let's let's make... He's, he's written about 16 tracks. The, the full soundtrack is going to be 36. Um tracks but yeah um there's gonna be music i i believe music is very important and as such it's i'm so glad to have to be working with um my friend mike he just he does such an excellent job i i love um full steam ahead is is going to be like that's kind of the the track that you use going throughout the skies and he just nails it absolutely nails it mm-hmm but <clears throat> with all, the, and I'll cert, I'll certainly look, I'll certainly be looking forward to seeing how that pl how that plays out. But with all of that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto my show and enjoy the madness at play here. Oh no problem! This was a lot of fun. And anytime you see fit to return to the temple, the door is always open. As I often say around here. Drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, I'll, I'll have a... I think there's a particular project that you're going to love. Um, it's called Punchline. That's Clown Punk. Oh, there's a story behind that one, too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, that, sh that comes up. Oh, I'm, sh I'm, sure we can, I'm sure we can cross that bridge when we get, when we get to that. But um, don't, yeah. um, <laughs> don't, don't tease me, man. Don't play with my emotions. <laughs> um, oh boy! But yep, and of the course, of and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>